Hello, everybody. This is Pete Spain speaking from San Diego, California, where it's still quite early in the morning. Appreciate you joining me for this presentation today about the wonders of phased array ADCPs and DVLs. And we've got a fair bit of material to cover. So hopefully there'll be a span of things of interest. So our talk today will focus on case studies using phased arrays and the take-home information really is summarized there that smaller sonars can really pack a punch. And we'll explain the advantages of the phased array and also some interesting stories of how they've provided unique advantages. So let's start with a couple of case studies. And then we'll turn to uh, talking a little more about data quality and how that relates to the uh, size of the ADCP and the DVL. And uh, then we'll look at a couple of examples of, of that information that I'll present about data quality. And then we'll wrap up with looking about at uh, products that are available today using phased array technology. So to begin, what we'll see as we go through the talk is that phased array is pretty much focused on longer range. Whatever the frequency, it's, it's trying to maximize the measurement range, whether it be the ADCP or the bottom tracking range of the DVL. And one of the motivations for that is people have become interested increasingly with time over what's going on in the deep ocean, particularly with the currents. And one of the reasons for that is, as everybody will know, there is a groundswell of interest towards understanding the Earth's climate system. And a key player in that is called the overturning circulation in the Atlantic, but it's actually fed by the waters from around the world. And what we know in the overturning circulation is that the surface waters are moving away from the equator towards the pole. And we're looking here at the uh, Western North Atlantic. So in red there, you can see the surface water of the Gulf Stream heading north. And back in the 50s, there was a prediction by Henry Stommel, which was subsequently verified that beneath that surface water heading north, there would be a focused undercurrent heading in the opposite direction. So there was a lot of interest when people first went out looking for this undercurrent, and it's become even more important because as part of the overturning circulation, the water that's being carried north submerges and then returns southward, and there's a lot of interest in where that southward transport is occurring and its intermittency and also its spatial variability. So on this picture, we're going to focus on uh, that site called number one, which was a data set collected by scientists from two different institutions. And it was actually a merging of deep water and coastal oceanographers. So they were very excited to have this cooperative work that revealed such interesting results. And later on, we'll also talk about some work by Tom Rosby and Charlie Flagg, and they use a cargo ship. And you can see the line there that's going from the mid left to uh, center bottom. That's a, a line that a cargo ship is running between New York and Bermuda. And the scientists have been making measurements there since the early 90s using an ADCP on board the cargo ship. So turning first to spot number one, and you'll notice in this picture, we've got the red to the north and the blue to the south. Okay, so that's the Gulf Stream. And on board the ship, 
pride of the fleet at Woods Hole Oceanographic, the Neil Armstrong, the scientists went out and made a bunch of sections off Cape Hatteras as part of the PEACH program. And these data were provided to us by Magdalena Anders. And I'm using them here to give you some idea of the power of the phased array. And this is a section across the Gulf Stream. And what you're seeing there is the profiling range that was possible with the first ADCPs on ships. They could measure down about 300 meters. And subsequent to that, 150 kilohertz systems came out and the profiling range crept down a little bit. And you could see there was some uh, intriguing observations that would have been possible at this site because what we're seeing is not only the surface water heading north, but you can see there is actually some water coming in the other direction, which would be the undercurrent that was predicted by Stommel. And for many years, the most of the ships in the US fleet carried 150 kilohertz. And some ships elsewhere in the world were carrying 75 kilohertz. And as we'll see later on, when phased array first came out, a lot of the US fleet converted their 150 kilohertz piston systems to 75 kilohertz phased array. And deeper profiling range was the motivation. So you can see there with the 75 kilohertz phased array on these ships, you're going to see more of what's going on. In fact, you're getting a good view of the fact that there is flow going in the opposite direction at depth. With phased array 38 kilohertz, which is going on to the newer ships, you have a even greater profiling range. So you can see there the power of phased array is giving you these magnificent pictures to great depth, whereas with the traditional piston systems, measurements were only possible to 75 kilohertz, which was, excuse me. So the traditional piston 75 kilohertz would see that. In order to see deeper, people switch to 38 kilohertz phased array. So that image pretty much summarizes the power of phased array for deeper profiling. Moving to the next case study, much higher frequency. In uh, very late 2016, a French sailor, Thomas Colville, circumnavigated the world in 49 days. In fact, he had been trying to break the record for some time. He'd had three unsuccessful attempts, and the record had stood for 12 years until he broke it. And he actually broke it by eight days. So, viva la France, congratulations. To onboard this racing tramaran was a Teledyne RDI DVL, it was phased array. And it was actually mounted in the center hull, which you can see in that picture there. One of the reasons it's mounted in the center hull is the boats are moving at very high speed and they tend to be have one hull out of the water a lot of the time. So the expedition or the race followed the track where the, the blue is the outbound and the red is the incoming part of the track. And so for two weeks, Colville headed south from France into the Southern Ocean. He picked up the strong winds called the Roaring Forties and then sailed around Antarctica. In fact, it took less than three weeks to sail all the way around Antarctica so that after 32 days of sailing, Colville reach the point here where we can see the two red arrows join and he headed north into the Atlantic and back to his homeland and the finish line. So one of the reasons the crew were interested in putting a DVL on board the Sodibo Ultim, the 32 meter trimaran, 
was that not only does the wind power the boat forward, it's also pushing the boat sideways. That's called leeway. And in competitive racing, they're very interested in sailing as efficiently as possible. And so they want to know how much they're being pushed off course by the wind. In fact, if you look behind the ship, you can see that the wake is no longer directly behind the ship when you have leeway. It's actually being carried off to one side. So that's the kind of an observable that you have leeway occurring. But in order to measure it, this team put in a DVL into the trimaran. And what you can see here is the different components of the motion. And the key notion here is the red arrow. So this is the sideways motion of the boat. So it's going across the heading of the sailboat. And for competitive sailing, knowing that information is key. And so what I've displayed here is the, the different contributions on the part of this picture. And so you can see that the DVL is measuring the red motion. So it's measuring the movement of the boat relative to the water. And so by combining the GPS measurements in green and the DVL measurements in red, you can also extract the ocean current data. So you've got a full picture of what's going on with the boat. The DVL was actually needed to be quite small. Go into that little cylindrical shape there. You can see the instrument installed on the left and removed on the right. It's an Explorer phased array. One of the advantages you can see is that flat face. It can go down. And what you can see at the bottom right is you don't actually see the water. The instrument was actually mounted inside the hull. And so it was measuring currents through the carbon fiber hull. An advantage of phased array is that its measurements uh, are insensitive to varying temperature. So normally you have to know what the speed of sound is in order to get the correct speeds. With a phased array, the measurements along the face of the instrument are insensitive to temperature and salinity. I mentioned the measurements were made from inside the hull. So you can see there what the hull looks like. And so you're probably wondering, where is the DVL? And it turns out there it's it's not actually that place where you would have probably thought it was. It's, it's designed so that it's not causing any additional drag as the water flows over the hull of the vessel. OK. So there's two exciting stories about phased array in the field. And uh, the essence of the talk today, I'm, I'm focusing it very much on a couple of topics. One of, and they're summarized there. It's, we're talking about profiling and packaging. And the take home information is described on this slide. And that is what you could see there. For a given size and performance, of your ADCP or your DVL, phased array technology provides the greatest measurement range or greater measurement range than the traditional solution of ADCP and DVL. And turning to why that is, you can see with phased array technology, we're actually measuring four beams from one face. I've given you some graphics there to describe that, but ultimately, by making the transmissions from one face, you're able to do it from a much smaller sized ADCP or DVL. And the beam pattern there shows that if you take a slice on each of those orthogonals, there's actually two beams being admitted in opposing directions in each of those slices. So that's how we're getting four beams from the one face. And what's the advantage of this? Summarized in this slide, here we're looking at 75 kilohertz systems. On the left is a traditional 
a piston ADCP on the right is a phased array. They're both 75 kilohertz systems. So you can see one face on a piston is the same size as the phased array. So in order to get the four beams into the water with a piston, you need four faces. With the phased array, you only need that one face. So there's different ways of taking advantage of the space savings. But typically, when we're talking about longer profiling range, the space savings are described there in the bottom left. And that is a 38 kilohertz phased array would be a similar size to the mounting plate that you're seeing there. On the left-hand side, you've got the four pistons, and behind that is a mounting plate. So that a 38 kilohertz system would be about the size of the mounting plate. And you can see a traditional four piston ADCP has that same size. So what we're summarizing on the left is that you can operate at a frequency that is lower by a factor of two with phased array compared with a piston system. So that 38 kilohertz in this case would fit into the same area that's required for the high fre higher frequency 75 piston system. And the phased array emits acoustic beams that are of the same beam width. So what we'll see in a minute is that the, the beam width that's emitted by the transducer depends on the diameter or the aperture of the face that's transmitting the signal. And because we're using a frequency that's lower by a factor of two, the ADCP can reach twice as far into the water. So what drove the invention of the, or the development of the technology of phased array was what I'm calling the current profiling conundrum. And this work was driven by the vision and passion and persistence of one man, and that man was Fran Rowe. And this is the summary of, of the current profiling conundrum, and that is, with using piston systems, in order to achieve a longer measurement range, you required, you, we were required to use larger size ADCPs and DVLs to avoid sacrificing data quality. And as we'll see in a minute, the size of those piston systems pretty much maxed out at about 75 kilohertz. And we'll, it was largely for practical reasons that we'll describe momentarily. But first, I want to talk about data quality, because what we're talking about is as you're changing the diameter or the aperture of a transducer, right, it's affecting the beam width and it makes better or poorer quality data. And let's, what I mean by that is here is a noisy current profile. And if you've got wide beams, you tend to have profiles that are noisier. They can also be biased. And it's problematic, especially on platforms that are moving more than about 2.5 meters per second, because the noise that you're seeing there on the profile is largely set by the beam width and the platform speed once you're going more than about 2.5 meters per second. So if you're looking at that, you might be wondering, where, what is the underlying current pattern? And so I've called that, described that over here on the right. So you can see in green, is what the underlying currents were. And then the noise associated with the measurement was superimposed on that pattern. There's a little caveat bottom left in the footnotes is there's multiple noise sources that are contributing to any of these measurements. And they're at various places in the communications channel. You get noise coming in at transmit, at receive, and also within the channel itself. What we're talking about today is the noise associated with the beam width. So what would low, low noise look like? Well, you're seeing that on the left. So you can see a low noise system gives you something that very quickly tells you what the currents are actually doing. The way to drive down the noise typically is to average pings together. And so that takes time. And particularly for DVLs, you don't want to take a lot of time in order to come up with an average measurement. You'd like a high update rate in your navigation. And so in order to operate at a lower frequency, your desire is to maintain the beam width 
in order to have high quality long range data. As you can see now, I've, it's showing you if we use a large diameter transducer face, you get the picture at left, small diameter, you get the picture at right. So when I'm talking about noise and data quality, just remember these pictures. So in our beam itself, 3D version is there. And what we can see, I've taken these images from this book that's identified bottom left. If you want to know about sonar, go look at a good radar book. And if you're looking for a good radar book, there it is right there. So what you can see is what's going into the water is actually a very complex pattern of um, energy. If we take a slice down the middle of it, and what we're focusing on here is the boresight line, which is what you're essentially where the beam is pointing. And when you're interpreting the returns, you're assuming they're all coming from that direction. But you can see the energy has actually been sprayed around somewhat. And we'll look at that momentarily. Here's another view of the beam width. And what my point here is to show how the, the width of the beam varies with the frequency. So what we see there is the wave, particular frequency, number of crests fit across the transducer face, and it comes up with a pattern that we'd see over there on the right. Now, if I transmit a lower frequency, what you could see is I get a fatter beam. So there's an inverse relation between the wavelength and So long waves give fat beams. What's important is the number of crests that fit across the aperture. So what's going on with phased array then is that because we're using one face instead of four faces, right, essentially we can use a larger face and therefore we can, when we operate at a lower frequency, we, we're capturing as many crests across the 38 kilohertz face as we do across the piston face at 75 kilohertz. So ultimately the beam width there you can see there is set by the number of crests across the face. Another way of looking at the beam pattern is here on the bottom right. It's the radiation pattern in two dimensions and I mentioned the boresight line and you can see there that would be the ideal beam width. There's a hairline distribution right down zero degrees. Oh, so in gold there, we're seeing this higher frequency system. Now, if we look at a low frequency system transmitted from the same face, you can see there's a spread. And that spread not only applies to the energy that's being distributed, it also applies to the Doppler shifted echoes that are returning. So what that means is the data will be noisier the wider the spread of that energy there on the right hand side. So you can see the fat beam has a wider spread in Doppler return, so it will have noisier data. So to summarize then, we got low frequency signals reach farther, data quality depends on the beam width, and the width of the sonar beam depends inversely on transducer diameter. We've just described that. But what sets the actual mechanical limits for how big the transducer faces can be? It turns out it varies, the reason varies somewhat depending on the frequency, but ultimately at lower frequencies, it's the handling and shipping and installation, et cetera, associated with the, is set, there needs to be a practical size and weight for operators. And so with piston systems, that was 75, kilohertz. And because the phase array system is able to take advantage of the compact packaging, a 38 kilohertz system meets that same criteria for practical size and weight handling for a 38 kilohertz system has similar size and weight to the 75 kilohertz. In the mid frequencies, I mentioned the US ship switched from 150 kilohertz pistons to 75 kilohertz phased array. A lot of ships have pre-existing transducer wells. 
And so people want to put the ADCPs into a pre-existing well. And so that's going to set how big the transducer size can be. And so that's a governing factor. People don't tend not to want to want to buy or spend money on new sea chests because they're significant expenses and there's a lot of logistical issues. And finally, for DVLs in particular, when you're trying to put them onto smaller and smaller vehicles, it's the size of the vehicles that's going to constrain how big the transducer size can be. So what you're trying to do is operate at the lowest possible frequency for a given diameter. And that's what the solution that was provided, provided by phase durée. And again, you want to use a low frequency to reach farther underwater, whether that's the profiling range or the bottom tracking. Here's a couple of stories of how people took advantage of that. In this picture, you can see the 75 kilohertz phased array. On the left is the 150 kilohertz piston. So the system on the left was on the ship. It was removed and replaced by the 75 kilohertz phased array. And uh, I mentioned Tom Rossby and Charlie Flagg have been measuring the Gulf Stream between York and Bermuda since the early 90s on board the cargo ship Oleander. And uh, the ship is now being retired and replaced, but it's provided there a quarter of a century of ADCP measurements. And that's what the installation looks like underneath the ship. So you can see the flat face of the ADCP. One of the advantages for there is that it's, it's you can see it's reducing the disruption to the flow that's going past the transducer face. And what you're trying to do is minimize the amount of disturbance and turbulence in front of the ADCP because that would create another source of noise in the measurements. So for the work across the Gulf Stream, here's a couple of uh, slices. The one picture at the left is uh, near surface transect, and you can see the, the black arrows are telling you the speed and direction of the flow, same down deep. And here are a couple of sections. The, the bottom panel is the essence of the north-south flow, and you can see the Gulf Stream there with that big red spot, and you can see how it's depth and it's how it's constrained in its width. You can see measuring down to 800 meters with the phased array, you are able to capture the, the vertical changes of what's going on there with the currents. And that type of information is used for a study like this one, where the scientists went in and looked at the data and found that contrary to kind of a, uh, an idea that was getting some press at the time, the Gulf Stream in their data set, there was no evidence that the Gulf Stream was slowing down. In fact, they found that over the period of 20 years, it had been remarkably stable. Okay, the uh, USS Indianapolis was lost at the end of World War II. Vulcan researchers went out three years ago. They're uh, led by Paul Allen, and they discovered the heavy cruiser deep in the Western North Pacific. And a key part of their work was using that ROV top left. And on board there was a first of its kind phased array, 300 kilohertz, which could operate to 6,000 meters depth. And it gave the ROV a bottom track lock of about 275 meters so that they were able to go down and survey anything that had been identified in side scan images. And the hovering ability of the ROV took advantage of the very quiet data from the phased array. So they were able to get bottom lock at a high altitude. And then once they were uh, taking video and camera images, the hovering because of the quiet data, produced very, very impressive high resolution images. Where are we in 2020? We've gone to very small phased arrays for small vehicles. There's the Pathfinder. You can see the size of the thing there relative to the coffee cup. We've also brought out a uh, lower frequency series called the Tasman. 
another DVL. And what's special about the Tasman is you can actually take the phased array off and make field replaceable. And there's a disassembled system. Uh, so that's another flat face advantage. It makes it very convenient for where you can replace the, the transducer assembly without sending it back to the factory. Another advantage of the Pathfinder and the Tasman are they now offer extended range tracking. So that's bottom tracking and it gets 60% more range using different signal processing in those two phased array systems. Finally, we turn to what's happening with ADCPs. And so you can now get a long range, self-contained or real-time ADCP operating to, or measuring to a thousand meters range. And you can see it's about the same size as the piston-based long range or ADCP, but it can profile about 40% farther. So that's the end of our fleeting visit to look at the smaller sonars that pack a punch. Happy to handle or take any questions if people would like to put them in the chat room or I'll turn on the microphone. Alrighty then. So, anybody who li uh, like to ask a question, the microphones should be on. Yeah. Oh. Hello, Peter. Hello. Oh yes, funny. I click <laughs> enough times and it comes on. Yeah. Hello, Peter. It's Tom, Tom Hiller here from um, Third Group near Norfolk in the UK. Um, hi there. I've got a question on how small and light can you make it for very small um, vessels and vehicles? The the push right now is to uh, make them small as a size of a can of Coca Cola. And weight in air? Oh, I'd have to ask Grant that. Can I uh, get back to you on that? It, it, so I'll send you an email and we can uh, get a conversation going. Perfect. Okay, thanks. Happy to take any other questions. Okay, I'm failing that. I'll say thank you very much for coming. I hope it was useful. Happy to take uh, any correspondence at that address down below. And hopefully you can uh, take advantage of phase array in your life, whether it be the Pathfinder and the Tasman, the Pinnacle, or one that's already installed on a ship you might be traveling on. Thanks for joining me today. Have a great day. Goodbye. <laughs>